want to thank everybody for joining us for another uh, webinar with our customers. Uh, it, it pains me to call it what it is, but it's conversation time with Larry, um, where <laughs> I, I, I hate the name, but I, we, we actually tried to find a better one and we couldn't do it. Uh, we, did, we weren't able to. Um, and we're going to be talking to, to Marla, Marla and Eric. Uh, you know what? I don't even know if I ever pronounced your last name. Heft? Oh. Heft. Yep. There we go. Uh, <laughs> of EZIT. They are friends of ours going back years. We've been working with them. Very bright, very thoughtful people. Uh, they get it. And it's really a, a pleasure to talk to them today. Um, the point of the call is obviously to understand what their journey is, what struggles they're going through, what they find valuable um, in their business and what's going on in the space. Obviously, this is kind of a dynamic time. It still is. Um, and just to be clear, as I said to Marla and Eric already, nobody here is bound by an NDA, which means that we will not ask and we hope that they will not provide any confidential information. This is all talking in generalities about the industry. So with that, I would like to introduce everybody to Marla and Eric and give you guys the opportunity to talk a little bit about your background and how you got here. Um, I'm a computer guy from way back. I got into computers in grade school won the state science fair, got a degree in computer science, cut my teeth doing software development and project management and program management. Always had an entrepreneurial spirit and I've started a couple smaller businesses before uh, EZIT, but um, it's kind of my background. Okay. And I am a finance person. I'm a CPA and I've worked part-time uh, for Eric. Uh, so family business here and his brother, since uh, our company's inception, uh, 20, was it 23, 23rd year in business. So um, yeah, my background, I've worked uh, in a family business uh, for, for some years early in my career and really got interested in the financial part of it and what, what the numbers meant, uh, you know, how business decisions affected uh, the company and, and how, you know, the finances were, uh, uh, you know, affected what could be done or what decisions could be made. And I yeah, went off to work for some big companies as well. Uh, and also a, a small CPA firm, kind of a specialty firm and, and also some, you know, various businesses and organizations uh, along the way. Yeah, very good. A couple questions just out of that um, from me. And obviously uh, we are leveraging the uh, webinar function in of the, of the tool, so if any questions you have, feel free to ask them uh, in the Q&A panel. Um, if you ask them to the chat, we may not get to them as quickly, so please do leverage that. Uh, so first, most importantly, Eric, what was the project for the State Science Fair that got you the ribbon? <laughs> I built a robot that played checkers, and it, it had a learning algorithm, so it would get smarter. So it was in 1983. So not too many robots at science fairs in 1983. You were pretty early on AI. Did somebody like look at your checker playing robot and then watch uh, the Terminator and think, this is what becomes that? <laughs> there you go, self-aware. <laughs> and then um, question for you, Marley, as a, as a CPA, and you, you still are a CPA? Mm -hmm. Yep. Um, working in you, I know that you guys, obviously how I met you is through peer groups and through uh, works with the coaches that we, you know, with C-level. What do you find working with MSPs, I mean, hopefully Eric is a, is a fairly receptive audience, but other MSPs, when you talk to them, as a CPA, are there any concepts that you find they have a difficult time accepting? Um, and you just want to say, listen, this is how the world works. You may have your beliefs, but fundamentally, let me, let me tell you, I am a trained accountant. This is how it works. I would say the main thing, and I haven't worked with other MSPs, I've actually worked with other companies and organizations in different industries. Um, and for a, you know, as a sort of CFO role, and I would say, you know, the main thing is, is understand how important, you know, your basic financial statements and a basic understanding and literacy, you know, about your P&L, your balance sheet and your statement of cash flow, sort of the original KPIs, you know, mm -hmm. understand that and, and start from there. And then, you know, systems like MSP CFO or, fantastic and giving, you know, additional, um, all kinds of, you know, additional information. But as far as, you know, just basic financial literacy, understand your accounting. Um, 
it's it's just it's important for so many reasons. Very good, very good. Um, now, you guys have had the business for twenty some odd years. You, it, we had mentioned a little bit earlier uh, when we were just talking that Marla, you come from a family business. Uh, your parents had a family business. You. Upon marrying Eric, you encouraged him to start a business because you saw the, the great things. What are some of the surprises, even though you came from this life? And I'll actually start with, with Eric. Although okay. you being a husband and wife, I'll let you interrupt each other and I will not be involved in that. <laughs> We're good at that. <laughs> no, I, I thought I knew what I was getting into starting a business, but uh, I would say some of my biggest takeaways were um, I didn't understand the level of stress I would be under the day that business had cash flow problems and employees. <laughs> the, the lost nights of sleep and that type of thing, I think we're, we're finally big enough or we're over a lot of that. Um, but that, that was a, a shocker to me. Um, the other takeaways I had is, you know, verticals. We started um, with most of our clients were in the communications industry in 1998. So in 2000 and 2001, the dot-com crash happened and MCI WorldCon was our largest client. And most of our clients were in communications and they cut back and they closed and they went bankrupt. So we learned that those verticals, it sounds great because of the margins, but uh, definitely a double-edged sword. And then uh, the last thing is the, you know, your worst clients can actually help you mature your service offering um, much faster than the, than the clients that are nice and friendly to you. And the other thing we found out is we have clients over 300 uh, users now. So we have our biggest one is 700 uh, employees. But when you get into these larger clients, over 300 users, their level of operational maturity is generally higher than ours. So that, that forced us to do better on reporting, to have real SLA reporting and to do things that they demanded. So it, kind of my takeaways, I didn't, I didn't look in my crystal ball and see those things. Would you say that you actually have two different approaches for the extremely mature client? and the somewhat, you know, the 10 person shop or 20 person, I don't know how this, where the small end is, is, is for you. Yeah, so a small client for us is 20 and a big client is 700. Generally our larger clients now are NSOC services clients. So we're an MSSP for them. Mm -hmm. uh, where our smaller clients are more traditional outsourcing clients. But, uh, you know, we, we've gone through our SOC 2 type two audit now. And part of that is because we're dealing with financial institutions that are demanding that we the, demonstrate that level of operational maturity. So we, we've had a rise to that occasion. Um, so it's been good to be pushed. And the 20 person shop doesn't even know what a SOC 2 is? No. <laughs> and we tend to be a lot more mature than the smaller companies. So we spend a lot of time pushing them. You know, you need standards for how you hire somebody. What's a new hire look like? What's a termination look like? So we we tend to drive them to be more operationally mature. Very good. So you're trying to also pull up your smaller companies. I think that's the way it works. When you get into a smaller company, you're gonna to have to pull them up. You get into a larger company, you gotta have your ducks in the room. And it's interesting the way you talk about your larger companies drive you to be a better company. Mm -hmm. I mean, we find the same thing to be certainly true. Uh, you know, a noisy client is a client that makes you work harder and makes you be better uh -huh. um, and yeah it's it's really a value and a quiet client doesn't really help you as much paying the bills is nice but the the active clients are the ones that really help you build your be your best yep um now getting into this you know obviously you talk about the the struggle and the the, the white knuckles and the sleepless nights of having to make payroll when you're worried about your checking balance mm -hmm. um what else do you wish you knew going in that would be a concern or something that you might want to, a risk you might have wanted to mitigate um, that you would tell your 20 year ago self? A risk to mitigate. There's a, there's a lot of stuff I wish I knew going in um, risk wise. So uh, we've been through three recessions now in our 23 years and um, keeping an eye on cash flow. Um, is something that, uh, that we really appreciate and value at this point because we ran really close at one point back in 2008. So cash is king. Um, and a downturn, cut your cost early and don't allow the company to bleed. Uh, that was a mistake we made in the first, the first downturn in the economy and the second downturn in the economy. Um, be prepared to lose some ground and become a smaller company if you need to. 
And then I already mentioned being in the wrong vertical can be very painful. Our communications vertical. Right. I mean, diversification is king. Um, if you were, I mean, you could play the game and say, oh, I wish I was in healthcare and healthcare and, and pharmaceuticals are booming right now. Mm -hmm. Or you could have done phenomenally well in hospitality and hospitality is getting killed right now. Mm -hmm. The thing that worries me is that you can play the game of try and get into the right vertical. And we've done, we've actually done research to show that if you're tighter in verticals, you actually experience faster growth because the referral base is very tight. Mm -hmm. um, but we don't know, I mean, the challenge that I always feel is we don't know what the next crisis is going to be. Right. I and mean, if you look at the last three recessions that you've been through, you've been through driven by 9-11, the banking crisis, and COVID, mm -hmm. which are completely unrelated. It and wasn't... <laughs> I'm sorry? I said and Y2K as well. And Y2K <laughs> leading into 9-11. Leading into, uh, so you can't say that 9-11 was going to was the, the, the precursor for the banking crisis. So the banking crisis was a precursor for COVID. There's no leading indicator of what's the next one is going to be. They just kind of happen every 10 years. Mm -hmm. Y2K and 9-11, and a little tighter. So your point is, you know, you kind of got to be prepared for any type of tragedy or tragedy, any hit to the economy. And my personal view is that it, it, and something else is going to happen in a bunch of years. It's not going to be COVID, hopefully. It's not going to be 9-11, hopefully. It might be a banking crisis, which of the three is the least painful. Mm -hmm. But it could be something else. And to your point, you know, make sure you have your cash. We tell clients, make sure you have your cash handy, be able to pivot quickly. Um, and I actually think that's one of the things about last year and PPP is that gave us all breathing room. We didn't, nobody had to change headcount for eight weeks. Um, because I know, at least for us, we were, it was on the table. Mm -hmm. So, uh, Marla, what do you think? I would also say to, you know, to know what your maximum risk is, you know, what, one of the things that got us during the, the 2008 recession was we had, you know, some staffing, uh, you know, people placed in a, and they were higher level staffing people. And, you know, then the, our client did not pay us and it was only two months worth of their work. But between that and then the legal bills to try to collect that, you know, it, it really, you know, if I look back and said, oh, wow, you know, two months of their billing is quite a bit of money. And we need to make sure that, you know, if somehow that doesn't materialize that, that we'll be okay. And, you know, look, do some projections, you know, some forward looking projections, you know, to understand what your, your cash flow is. Right. One of the things that we actually did working with clients this year, we found is you know, the, the concept, I think it goes back to Churchill was the one who said it, but it's attributed to pretty much everybody, is uh, never waste a crisis. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that I truly hope people did last year was some serious receivables analysis. Mm -hmm. You know, when your clients started getting nervous and they started stretching their payments to you because they didn't know what, if they'd have to make payroll and they were gonna have issues and maybe they'll extend a vendor, you need to have a process in place to review that quickly and know which phone calls need to be made that is gonna squeeze money, or if these people are just not going to be paying you where you need to cut back on what you're providing. Um, you know, if you're paying, you know, Microsoft for Azure licenses, and these people aren't paying you, you say, well, listen, you know, we're not gonna front you the money for Microsoft. Mm -hmm. Right, um, so, and like Eric said, you know, make, make the decisions faster than you, you think you might need to, <laughs> because- right. Because, you know, the mistakes, uh, yeah. Yeah, we didn't want to let anybody go. You know, we didn't want to cut salaries. We're just going to weather it. This can't last long. It'll last longer than you think. <laughs> now, you've been through a couple of crises, as you say. Um, the COVID crisis, while incredibly scary, and obviously from a health perspective, incredibly scary for our space, really... We were not hit as hard as other ones were. I mean, we should not be the ones that are complaining the loudest. Um, what did you think going into it that made you better prepared because you went through the last two or three? We really, Marla, we really lean on her. Uh, my brother and I got with Marla and said, you know, we need projections, like worst case, best case, how are we on cash? We went through all our customers and we did a risk analysis on every customer. 
what we thought the situation was going to do to them and what that might mean to us. So we did a bunch of what if scenarios and kind of based our decisions on that. Yep. And so it, working part time to <laughs> 50 hours a week for you know the first uh, first part of the the crisis. You know what's yeah what do we need to know? What do we need to do? What do we need to plan? Um, yeah. Right, and it didn't work out to be your worst case scenario. Mm -mm. We had a great year. Surprisingly, <laughs> you know, we have some clients where we really did assess some risk there, and it, it did not seem to materialize. So pleasantly surprised. That being said, though, um, what we found across the industry is that the MRR business was exceptionally stable. It was barely a blip in the MRR business. The project business, the transactional TNM, the product business, from what we saw across the industry, across all the clients, did take a little bit of a hit. I mean, obviously, if you're doing installs, nobody went on site for three months. So that just didn't happen. Right. And we expected that because that's what we saw during the last recession. Uh, for us, that did not materialize. We, we had record product sales. We, I don't know how many PCs, but maybe 1,500 PCs since COVID started that we sold and deployed. And uh, we are just, uh, there's a lot of people that see a much higher value in our service. So we brought on 12 new clients last year and we turned away a lot of companies that weren't a good fit for us. So we, we had a lot of opportunity and professional services was strong because we had clients building terminal server farms and upgrading firewalls and doing all the stuff they needed to do for a remote workforce. These clients you picked up, where did they come from? From other MSPs that weren't doing well or they were half kind of doing half, on their own? Uh, half and half. We had a couple that uh, actually had MSPs and they ended up getting viruses and they had ransomware and they decided to make a change. And we had clients that they got ransomware and viruses. They had internal IT and their internal IT couldn't handle it. So they decided to make a change, um, that type of thing. That works out well. I mean, you guys have a good year. We are, as we were saying before, that you know our space just probably isn't eligible for PPP because largely the people did quite well. Um, just looking over a couple of notes here. Now, what what do you see as sort of current challenges? Um, and as we get into that, one of the things I ask you is that you know you said you were very busy last year, but we did see across the industry, maybe not as much at Easy, but um, Easy IT, uh, a drop off a little bit in transactional business. Are, do you have a concern, and this may be sound like an odd question, that the economy is going to really pick up maybe this summer when everything comes back to normal, hopefully comes back to normal? Are you concerned about risk on the upside? Risk from what, I guess? I, and I, I, it almost I, sounds silly coming I, out of my mouth. Yeah. So much business. Too much business, do you think? Yeah. Well, yeah, we, we do speak about, uh, you know, a growth rate of uh, uh, too high, <laughs> you know, too much. Absolutely. We need to understand what it is we can handle and what we can't. Um, Eric can, I'm sure, speak more to that. Yeah, we really, when COVID hit, we put a hiring freeze on. I was trying to hire two people. And then, of course, our ticket volume tripled the all-time record we had. As all our clients said, you know, to their employees, grab your PC, go home and call Easy IT. Great. <laughs> so we we really did push our staff too hard last year and since then i've added uh three more ftes which has really helped and i'm hiring one more um just to compensate for the growth but it was it was painful for our staff to grow that much and be that busy last year for sure did you have any troubles find trouble finding people i the the uh whole recruiting market at least in columbus ohio has really loosened up i'm finding fantastic candidates so for you this was almost a the opposite of a perfect storm. Like business was great. Talent pool opened up. Yep. It was just things that, I mean, I, I, obviously COVID's awful, but it worked out from a business perspective in that narrow, very narrow sense to worked out well. Yep. Um, Our challenge, I mentioned this to you earlier, is uh, we've been lucky until this week because we've had no employees with COVID. We have had employees who have lost family members and you know that's been hard for them. But uh, we did have the one guy who rarely comes into the office. We only have eight people out of 35 in the office. But the one guy who rarely comes in and wears a mask, I have to yell at, he had COVID on Friday, he tested positive today, and a number of us were exposed to him. So that, that has been a real worry. We assumed at some point we might have an outbreak in the office. So we have you know backup plans for who's going to do whose job if people are out and that type of thing. 
the eight people that come in, including yourself, you all have home offices. So if you're not sick, but quarantining, you can still do your work. Um, yeah, most everybody. We have one person who does shipping and receiving and office administration stuff. It'd be hard for her to work remotely. But other than that, everybody else can work remotely. And then and the primary reason we have people in our office is I'm hiring new people and I need them to be trained and supervised and somebody to listen in on their calls. And we have a really good culture. So we're trying to you know, embed that culture in anybody new we hire. Well, hopefully Ohio gets plenty of shots and your, your employees can all get vaccinated soon. Um, just take a quick look at some of the other questions I, I prepared. All right, if we could talk a little bit about, and, and if anybody has any questions for Eric and, and, and Marla, please feel free to chime in as well. Um, let's talk a little bit about how you operate the company. You know, you've definitely, whatever business metaphor you want to look at, you're at scale, you know what good looks like, you're building um, real operations. What do you look at in your business from a metrics perspective to understand if things are going in the right way or they're not going the right way from the, the macro to the micro? I could talk uh, to the service delivery side. So, you know, we, we have a phone system that allows us to look at call abandonment, but we weren't really looking at those reports. And what happened to us is when our workforce went remote, um, people were less likely to sign into the call tree. And uh, we found out the hard way by customer complaints last year that calls were being abandoned. So that call abandonment report out of the phone system is really important, especially as your business changes and how you provide service. Um, I use BrightGauge for a ton of reporting. So I've got things like user-generated ticket volume. So I'm really trying to look at that to say, are, you know, are we staffed correctly? Um, we do uh, our internal SLA through ConnectWise. We're measuring our SLA. So that's something I actually report on to our entire staff at our weekly lunch and learn. Uh, we use BrightGauge for, or actually we use, uh, not BrightGauge, for CSATs. I forget what we're using for CSATs. But anyway, we have CSATs. And uh, we were using um, We used Press to use callback. Simple set. Biz ratings. Biz ratings. Biz ratings, yeah. So we, we every week at Lunch and Learn review all our CSATs for our staff, and they're really high and kind of celebrate that. Um, I have reports in MSP CFO. I look at tech, technician utilization, and we have a bonus plan for our technicians that's tied to revenue, that's tied to them. They all have access to sign in to MSP CFO. So I spend time talking to our technicians about their utilization and then our clients and how efficient our clients are, where revenue comes from. It's been a great tool. And then um, open projects hours remaining and project analysis through MSP CFO. Um, we use that. And also I built, it's been a while, but in Report Writer, we built a program management report that shows all the projects we're working on and how they're doing to budget and how long the projects have been open. And then we've got user-defined fields in the project module where we could uh, set the quick status and does it need to discuss. So we have a whole program management kind of report that we use. Is that the first thing you do when you come in the office is just sort of cycle through the metrics? Um, so on Monday, we have our leadership and our professional services meetings. We go through the metrics. And then on Wednesday, we go through the metrics with the whole staff at lunch and mark. Okay. Um, remind me after this call, we'll have a conversation about staffing utilization because we do have a report in MSP CFO, <laughs> not for this call, where we will show you what <laughs> FTEs you need for the work that you're doing, but we can get to that another time. Oh, sounds good. Um, what about you, Marla? So, you know, as far as the, the financial, um, I did, uh, did want to mention, so Kurt, uh, Eric's brother and, and co-owner, um, he uh, is more involved in, in the sales side of the business, and he, he says the uh, the PNL, the client PNL from MSP CFO is fantastic when he's looking at client, you know, new uh, client renegotiation of, of contracts. Uh, and then also, you know, any new MRR, you know, we're of course looking at that <laughs> because a lot of, uh, you know, our other business obviously flows from the, the new MRR, whether it's cloud services or professional services, uh, et cetera. Um, as far as you know, our finance and accounting, um, you know, our our process for that, uh, you know, monthly monthly closing the books. I've seen this, uh, you know, again at, at other companies outside of not doing that, but you know, looking at your financials monthly, going through the accounts, and you know, making sure someone is is understanding uh, the the numbers <laughs> that are in the accounts. 
and can explain it and make sure that, you know, understand the story behind it. Um, and, you know, taking note, taking that, taking the, the, you know, the financial information and looking at some ratios, you know, um, uh, on the income statement, of course, your, your margins, um, balance sheet ratios, uh, you know, so that would be your, you know, number of days that, uh, collections AR, you know, um, working capital ratios, uh, et cetera. And, you know, looking at all of this, not only in, in the period you're, you're examining, but also through time, uh, and, in relation to your budget or your forecast, you know, what is it you thought would happen and then what did happen and what's the difference? Uh, and it also helps when you do that on a regular basis, you know, getting better at your, your budgeting. I mean, I, it's one of the things that, that I learned, you know, Eric and Kurt would just give me some numbers. This is what I think is going to happen. <laughs> and, and the early years of our business and it, you know, that's not backed up in any kind of reality. Um, you know, examine that and uh, we you know we're always looking at that um and then also you know looking at the numbers not just to, to know what how we can improve but also as a as a sort of a verification tool i mean that's a lot of my job is what you know what what is this why did you know why is this number here who authorized this you know what uh what does this mean and you know making sure that you're um you know, that it all makes sense to you. And again, I've seen this outside that it's, it's not always the case, um, but, it, but it is really, you know, really important. I'll tell you, one of the okay. best things that Marla's done for Kurt and I is uh, make this all visual. So when we meet with her monthly to do our finance and accounting meeting, um, she has a ton of graphs that trend our our MRR over the last three years that trend our gross margin, our margins on different you know lines of business, and you know visually, I, you know staring at numbers is great if you like spreadsheets, but visually seeing graphs that show trends over time it is more actionable and uh, facilitates a conversation much better than just staring at the balance sheet. Oh sure. And, and I do take you know we use QuickBooks for our accounting. I do take numbers out of there on a monthly basis. Takes me about ten minutes a month, not not long, but I take the key information and then from there can do all kinds of fun stuff with it. Uh, okay, a question came in, Molly. I think it's more for you. Um, when you look at the numbers, is it primarily looking back, or do you forecast forward on a regular basis? Um, we do forecast forward. Uh, it was, you know, a little more important. Uh, I guess an earlier in our company to to do that forecasting forward and make sure that you know we're really uh, we're really on it now. It's just because we're bigger and and the, the you know the MRR contracts are a little more stable. That you know we're we're looking at our budget and and if if we um, you know if we feel like there's uh, you know, some sort of change that warrants, we will kind of turn that into a forecast and, and make that change. But again, we're, we're trying to look at it. Uh, what did we expect to happen? And then, um, you know, what did happen? But yes, it, it is important to forecast forward and also include your a cash forecast in there, you know, very important. Come down to cash. How, uh, you know, how do you, how do you expect the company's operations to affect your cash? going forward, whether, you know, you're using it, per, you know, perhaps to invest in, in something, um, you know, for example, we made a, a prepayment for some services at the end of 2020 that we know we're going to be using in 2021 to get a discount, but, you know, can we do that? We better understand our future cash flow in order to, you know, make that decision, uh, whether, right. you know, that was a good or bad idea. Does that make sense? Is that? I, know I mean, you guys have a lot of momentum with the MRR. There is more momentum, yes, than, than so, there used to be. And it, it's a little harder to, you know, the, the changes don't seem to be so dramatic as, as they used to be. Right. So short of an event like last year, you don't really get so much into reforecasting on a regular basis. Um, not unless there's, a, you know, something happens, correct? Or, yeah, or we're noticing something. Yeah, exactly. Okay. Um, now, we met, uh, as I said earlier, we met early on, I think through our relationship with, with C-Level, but I've seen you guys 
pretty much four times a year at all the Evolve meetings. Mm -hmm. uh, can you talk a little bit about how helpful those are to, um, uh, to uh, how you've grown as a business and also maybe how you think about metrics? Uh, if you're on the same page, what disagreements you might have with your lovely, lovely friends in your Evolve group? <laughs> Well, it, we actually were in peer groups before Evolve. We were in Vistage here locally in Columbus. And uh, we got we got value out of Vistage, um, but they weren't people in our industry. So it was more general business value. Um, Evolve is a whole different world. I think we've been in HTV and Evolve for nine years now. And uh, we get a lot of good information about tools, what tools works productization, you know, how do you bundle things? Uh, what's, you know, one thing that came up in our career is that, you know, we compare through the service leadership index, we compare ourselves to our peer group and to best in class. And we realized our product margins were really low and it turned into a misunderstanding with the person who does quoting about our target margin and the difference between markup and margin. They didn't realize there was a difference. So, I mean, that's something that came out of the peer group. We never would have thought that our margins were so low compared to the industry until we got to see the data side by side. And they but, said, um, just, just raise it, just, just charge more. Just and raise it, it, <laughs> it worked. And our peers told us, raise it, it'll work. And so I, there's a lot of value. I can't say enough about Evolve and HTV and being in a industry specific peer group. I will say it's a little intense sometimes just watching it. I'm, I'm more on the outside, uh, but it's, it can be a little intense, but um, hard they, love. <laughs> it's hard, yeah. hard right. love, and yeah. I've sat on a few lunches there, and yes, there is. Uh, uh, how, how would I put it? Some foul words used with kindness. <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, one more question that came in for you, Eric. Uh, for new leads, do you use? Uh, they talk about using SEO and SEM. Or what other types of marketing do you use to get a new business? Or is it, it sounds like, and I don't want to put words in your mouth, it sounds like a lot of what you're doing right now is referral. So um, things changed from us. Uh, previously, it was mostly referral. We hired a woman three years ago, has a, she has a degree in marketing management, and we hired her into a sales position. So she actually gave us some focus on marketing. And then we, we've gone through two different uh, third-party marketing companies. We finally have one that's really good. And uh, they redeveloped our website. They're running campaigns. So we finally are getting traction with marketing. We are getting leads from our campaigns. And, and we're a lot more relevant from an SEO standpoint out there. So you are getting stuff coming in through the web? Yes. OK. Uh, so you do use, so the answer was yes, uh, use that. And you have a, an in-house marketing person. Yep. And a third-party marketing person. And a third, and a third-party marketing person. Right. Um, this is not, this, I did not write this question. It came in from somebody. Um, how specifically has MSP CFO changed the way you manage your business, PL, and operations as a whole? So, how we got to MSP CFO, we, so we implemented ConnectWise with ConnectWise. We had a bunch of goofy contracts, and ConnectWise did us a disservice by showing us how to mess with the ConnectWise configuration to make it support our contracts. None of the reporting in ConnectWise worked because of how we, excuse the term, bastardized the configuration. Um, C level led, led us through a re-implementation of ConnectWise. We got rid of uh, our boards, had new boards and workflows and standardized on type, subtype item, all that kind of stuff. Once we standardized ConnectWise and the data was good, we engaged with MSP CFO. Um, and the goal was to, number one, have a reporting tool, but number two, we really wanted the bonus plan. We wanted a technician bonus plan that was tied to revenue that they would bring in. So we drank the Kool-Aid on that. I think we've been on that bonus plan about four years now, and it's been great. Just to clarify, it's not necessarily the revenue they bring in, it's the revenue they work because the techs don't really sell it. Associated with them, revenue yeah. associated. Yeah. <laughs> the work the work <laughs> they did. <laughs> yeah. Yes. What is, what is that worth, revenue wise? And I would add to the, the project uh, project analysis, the fixed fee project analysis and profitability. You know, that's yeah. that's been a huge window uh, into our our business as well. And uh, yeah, we've we've gotten a lot out of it. I sort of tortured uh, Larry, Larry early on with lots of questions. Um, and I appreciate it. The product's better for it. I, I, I say that sincerely. Um, I mean, it used to be my, my dad, my father, um, who passed away years ago, uh, used to say, uh, and I, I would never refer to you this way, Marlon, 
So do you know what you call um, an annoying paying client? A paying client. <laughs> <laughs> I would actually put it slightly differently. I would say, you know, you somebody go. who pushes us to be better. We've had clients who've actually been not as pleasant as you are, but pushed us to do things. And while I, and I think you might be the same way, under my breath, express some frustration. In the end, I was really pleased by what they pushed us to do. So we'll count this one as answered. Another question came in and we're gonna wrap this up just these last two questions unless anything more comes in. Um, if you're comfortable sharing, who are you using for third-party marketing? If you're not comfortable sharing, that's fine. I, you know, I'm comfortable sharing. I can't remember the name of it. We just went to them six months ago. I can, uh, I can, I can look it up. Uh, well, I guess the the it's the work that's really great, not so much the person. <laughs> All right. So, uh, sorry U about that. U U Ulistic, U L I S T I C, is the. Oh, that's uh, uh, Stu. Um, Stuart. Uh, oh gosh, I forget his last name. But yes. Yeah, we actually went to a conference. They did very, yeah. very early in us. My partner's on the call, my brother, so he's he's feeding me information in the chat. <laughs> uh, so it, another question with regard to that, it is Ulystic. Uh, Stu Crawford is his name. Yes. Um, and then there's another question with regard to appointment setting. Did you guys ever go through the path of using third-party appointment setting service? Um, we have tried. Like we, we had... Uh, um, Dialing moms. There was a local group that hired part-time moms to do dialing, and um, and we tried out-of-state companies that did lead generation. And have never had any luck with any of that. Yep. Uh, I will say, from my perspective, uh, we actually worked with managed sales pros a couple times. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I think uh, Carrie's a very good friend. I think she's she's one of the one of my favorite people when I see her at conferences, present company excluded. Um, and sometimes it's been phenomenally successful for us. Like mm -hmm. we started our business based on what they did. Sometimes it's been less so. It really depends on the situation. Mm -hmm. um, but for us, it, it worked out very, very well. Um, so there's that as well. Well, I think we, we've gone over by about 10 minutes. I'll answer this question as well. Um, listen, Marla, Eric, thank you so much for taking your time today. Um, I do hope everything works out with your employee who tested positive and, and everything else going on with the, the virus. I very much look forward to seeing you all again. I, I'm, my fingers are crossed that it's, uh, we, I get to see you in, what would it be, Denver? Yep, <laughs> hopefully. Uh, I'm, yeah, I'm pretty sure, I'm pretty sure uh, May isn't happening, but hopefully I get to see you in Denver. Um, and I look forward to getting back on the road and, and thanks a lot for your time today. Okay, thanks much, Larry. Pleasure. Take care, everybody. Have a, have a great day. Thanks, you too.